Paris is more than a great city, more than one of the great capitals of the world. It is a universe containing many worlds. It has been at the center of our civilization for so many centuries that we would need more than a lifetime to know it and appreciate it fully. As we see it spread out before us from the Arch of Triumph, there are familiar landmarks, the Eiffel Tower, the Cathedral of Notre Dame, the Champs-Élysées, the Tuileries, the Louvre, the Opera, and the hundreds of famous buildings, bridges, and gardens. But even to a Parisian, the city is so large and contains so many facets of business, government, religion, industry, trade, and all aspects of culture that he can be familiar with only a small part of the city's long and dynamic life. That part which represents the arts is symbolized by Montmartre dominated by the Sacre Coeur Church. Among the narrow streets like Rue Le Pic, which wind up the hill of Montmartre, generations of artists, painters, musicians, writers, sculptors, have found a sympathetic understanding among the working men and shopkeepers, who, like other Parisians, are the most democratic of people. Here, there are no questions of tolerance as to color, creed, or race. Human differences have been accepted for so many years that they are not matters for debate. Montmartre is like a village set within a city. Its own history goes back over the 2,000 years to Roman times, when a temple was erected here in honor of Mercury or Mars. The spires of the new church of Sacré-Cœur, site of the old temple, and of the first Christian church erected by the Parisi, the Gallic fishermen who lived here long before Caesar's invasion, before the Christian era. The past, whether recent or distant, is a living part of the present. Rebellions and wars in these streets. But Paris, even though beautiful and fascinating to artists, is more than buildings. It is a city to be loved, young and beautiful. It is like a woman stately with age, beloved by millions. The wisdom of experience, like the Moulin de la Galette and the old mill wheel that once ground flour for Paris, is the heritage of a past that is rich, a heritage that includes a great love of the arts, the applied arts and the fine arts. The taking of a nap at lunchtime, the taking of a walk, riding on a horse-drawn bus, all are parts of an artistic way of living. The enjoyment of outdoor exhibits of drawings and paintings is characteristic of a people who make an art of life itself. They do not rush hurriedly through life, but enjoy it with an artistry that is to be found in their conversations, in the way they prepare their foods, or the way they conduct their business. And since the Parisians themselves are so knowing and understanding of the arts, it is little wonder that Paris attracts artists from all over the world. Little wonder that there are usually some 50,000 painters making Paris their home. Many paintings, now famous, were first exhibited in the streets or cafes. Hundreds of painters, now world-renowned, found understanding in these streets. Americans often think of Montmartre in terms of cabarets and bohemian ways of living, but in doing so, they forget that Montmartre has been the home not only of the Moulin Rouge, but of great artists like Victor Hugo, Zola, Berlioz, and hundreds of others who lived in a tradition of artistry that was somewhat bohemian, like this guardian in Napoleonic costume, but still nurtured the work of art genius. The center for the magnificent history of French artistry is the Louvre. The building itself goes back to the 12th century. The Louvre is the world's greatest treasury of paintings and sculpture. Great paintings from other countries, such as those of Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Raphael, Titian, El Greco, Dyck, Rembrandt. But the Louvre is also the shrine of great artists. Watteau's The Indifferent represents the elegance and light gaiety of his times but also the sense of balance, pattern, rhythm, and harmony of color of all French painters since the time of Francis I in the 15th century. 
Under even the formalism and general artificiality of the court painters, there is found a high standard of craftsmanship. France has been of art since early in the 18th century. The names of her great artists are legion, and her schools of thought on painting have led the way of advancement even to our own day. From the men whose paintings we are sampling, Watteau, Clouet, Lapierre, Boucher, Robert, and now Jacques-Louis David, we inherit a tradition of artistry that includes all schools, the classic, the romantic, and today the expressionistic. Anne Gray's painting, Roger Delivering Angelica, may well represent the classic school, Gustave Courbet's The Studio, the realistic school. Such men led the way for the great French painters whose names are highly familiar today, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Cezanne, Matisse, Picasso, and their followers. Yet the painters are but one group among French artists. Architectural monuments such as the Palais Royal remind us of the playwrights Corneille, Racine, Molière, of the great Rabelais, Montaigne, Voltaire, poets Villon, Baudelaire, Verlaine, famous novelists of our own era, Roland, Guide, Proust. In music we know best César Franck, Debussy, Ravel. The more modern artists find representation here at the Petit Palais, the Museum of Fine Arts for the city of Paris. France has not only traditions of art centuries old exemplified by the Louvre, but art is so much a part of everyday life that the Parisians understand the experiments of the younger schools too, and their attempts to create new form is in an older tradition. But its spirit is young and adventurous. Its gardens and arcades reflect the Frenchman's constant enjoyment of both natural and formal beauty, and create a proper setting for works of creative imagination. In outdoor galleries as well as indoors, sculptural works of our times demonstrate the ancient lineage of French sculpture as it blends with modern work, such as that of Charles Malfray, whose creations in stone and iron are in the traditions of medieval church sculpture, as well as in the traditions of more recent sculptors, such as the great Auguste Rodin, or of Mayol and Despiaux. In many countries outside of France, the artist is often in advance of his times. The people do not understand what he is trying to do. But the French understand their artists and honor them. Like Parisian sculptors well known today, Godier Bersheska, Brancusi, Zadkin, Modigliani, and Herzog, the work of these men is in good measure the product of the understanding they receive from the French people. Here we see the president of the municipal council and other Parisian personalities attending the inauguration of an exhibit. Their presence is not only an official recognition of the importance of the arts in the cultural life of France, but they represent the spirit of all their countrymen. Thus, in the Arch of Triumph, a symbol of the Frenchman's love of democratic freedom, it is significant that in erecting such a symbol of national unity, that the arts should be represented in its structure. The French spirit of 1792, as depicted in Rude's group called La Marseillaise, is in a language all the people know. Just this appreciation gives balance to the economic, political, religious, and scientific aspects of a culture which in the past 2,000 years has nationed.